Hey! We're live! We're live! Awesome! Hello! Um, so we're going to do quick introductions. My name is Kaya Rose. And I... And I'm you Eric go. Man. I, Sorry, I thought you were going to say more. I'm Eric Mann. <laughs> um, so we are both filmmakers based in New York City. We're in New York City now, so um, if sirens go by, excuse the noise. Um, so we're both independent filmmakers, and we uh, were lucky enough to win one of the Film for Climate Awards last year. Um, we made a video about carbon pricing, and we won the best short film for carbon pricing. Um, and the Connect for Climate people were lovely and took us to Marrakesh, and we got to meet everyone there, and it was amazing. So uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, a couple different things. Well, first of all, answer any questions you have, so feel free to post questions in the comments, and we'll, um, we'll get to them. Try to address them as best we can. Yes, indeed. Yeah, um, and then we'll also just talk a little bit about carbon pricing and about um, why we think filmmaking is such a powerful tool. Um, and storytelling, and uh, we'll see where the conversation goes. Kai, how did you get started in filmmaking, just so they know? Ah, um, well, good question. <laughs> um, I've been doing this for a long time. I actually started in theater, and then I moved into filmmaking. I went to school in England, um, worked for an animation company for a while, and then kind of found myself wanting to make work that was more socially engaged. Mm. Um, and and kind of felt like I was contributing to the world. So I moved to New York and um, pretty soon after I moved here actually I started taking an online, one of those free online courses about uh, climate action and climate policy and I found out there was this thing called COP21 which was happening at the end of 2015 and it, it could kind of shift the whole game and I was like I didn't know anything about this. Why don't I know about this? Um, and so the more I started reading about it, the more I thought I should make something about this. And so I felt like if I didn't know about it, lots of other people my age didn't know about it. And it felt really important and it felt like we should be involved. So, yeah. so that set me on this path. Well, I'm glad you did that because I didn't know anything. So I'm Eric Mann. Hi. Yes, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was trained as an actor, and uh, about four or five years ago, I picked up a camera, and I started filming um, personal projects, and then people started hiring me, and Kaya, I brought, she brought her on board as an editor for my company, and then she started getting into this, and when you started getting into it, it kind of, I didn't know anything about it either, and it was like, I feel like I'm an informed citizen, I know what's going on in the world, but then I didn't know anything about any of this. Right. And then you approach me and you're like, hey, you want to help film this? And I said, absolutely. I want to learn more. And I feel like that's what I can contribute to this, this issue that's at hand. Because, you know, I feel like I have certain tools. But filmmaking is something that I feel passionate about in yeah. that way. And I think that that's kind of like a big picture climate change thing is that everyone has tools that they can make and they can bring to the table. Yeah. to address the issue. Yeah, and it really is, I feel, the kind of existential issue of our time, especially as sure. young people. This is kind of the big issue that underlies everything that we really have to, to kind of deal with and figure out how to create mm -hmm. solutions. And, and I think you're right, like, there's a kind of a, a feeling that, like, oh, I should you know, go back to school and kind of retrain in like policy or something. But like there are lots of people that are really good at policy and something like the skill set that I have is like I make films <laughs> and I tell stories. So I thought, well, I can at least I can bring those skills to the table mm -hmm. and try to and try to help communicate issues because that is that's a big I mean, that's one of the big reasons why we made this carbon pricing video really right. is that we kind of, we were going, we were talking to lots of people, we were talking to scientists, we were talking to activists, we were talking to academics, policy makers, um, all sorts of people. And one consistent theme that kept coming up is everyone is saying, well, this is what I'm doing, but if there was a price on carbon, it would make my work a lot easier. Um, and so it kind of kept coming up, and we thought, well, we should look at this. Uh, as a solution, like what is this carbon pricing solution? Right. Um, and we made this video, and I feel like it's something that it it it's kind of a one of those solutions that accelerates everyone else's solutions. It kind of enhances everyone else's work. 
um, and most people don't really know what it is. Right. So we thought, well, our skills as filmmakers, like we can tell the story of carbon pricing and, and help illuminate this a little bit. Because um, at the heart, I feel like it's actually a really kind of elegant and quite simple concept and simple mm -hmm. solution. Um, I, I, well, as we've been told over and over again, it's the silver bullet yeah. for fixing this issue. Because you're right, it is a very, it's a very simple issue um, and a very effective issue. I mean, a, a, a effective solution, solution yeah. to making, um, to really changing the field. Then the question comes, why is it not working? Why is it? Right. Which is what we're going to get into. <laughs> um, well, actually, we get, we're, going we're, go, we're going right, right there. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, so carbon pricing, you're right. It, like, it, it touches on everything, and, and it kind of, it, it's, it's a silver bullet in the way that it, it moves everyone else's solutions forward, and mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of like, it goes back to the cause of climate change. Like, why is it happening in the first place? I would say it's not a silver bullet in the way that like we only have to price carbon and then we'll be fine. Like we need, we need all of the solutions. Everyone's working on amazing stuff, and we need all of it to happen. <laughs> we need, you know, clean energy. We need innovative technology. We need policy. We need all these things. But if you put a, a good price on carbon, you know, in this in the states, for instance, or you know, there are places doing it around the world. And if you start to link these systems up and kind of harmonize them, then then what you'll be doing is addressing the very reason why we're having this crisis in the first place, which is that we're putting our, our economies are very much based around fossil fuels, um, and these fossil fuels are artificially cheap at the moment. They seem cheap, so companies there's a lot of companies that are making a lot of money off of these because they seem like good investments, but they have a cost. After they're used, they emit pollution, and this pollution not only infects the air and therefore the air that we breathe and affects our health. It also is creating a warming problem where the CO2 in that pollution is warming our globe and that's creating a much bigger problem like extreme weather events and ice caps melting and coral reefs drought. dying and drought and it's a whole slew of problems. So those all have costs. Um, we have costs because extreme, you know, more health care because we're not as healthy as we would be if we had cleaner air. Um, costs of storm damage, costs of, you know, water, having to get water from other places, costs of, you know, ecological costs, all sorts of costs. And what's happening is that those costs are ending up at the end and they're not being factored into the original price of the fossil fuel. So actually, taxpayers are paying that cost. We're paying that cost. Instead, what carbon pricing does is it just takes those costs that already exist and puts them into the price so that they're accounted for at the very beginning. So when it comes across the border, comes out of the ground, any company that chooses to get that fossil fuel or you know, get that oil, get that coal and turn it into a fuel and sell it, they have to factor in that price first. And what that would do if we had a, a good price on the carbon pollution at that point is that then it wouldn't seem so cheap. And companies would start looking at that and saying, actually, that's not a very good investment I'm going to take my money and invest in wind power or invest in solar mm -hmm. power. Um, and those are actually better investments because so, they don't have those costs at the end. Yeah, and it's taking taking all of the... It's a win-win. Win, it's a win across win, the win, board. Win-win, win-win, win-win. <laughs> because you're simultaneously... You're, you're steering away from fossil fuels, right? And you're also supporting healthy people. Right. You're he a healthy environment. So the 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 whole person and nations are benefiting from this. Yeah. And you're and and in that way the world can reset itself. Um, we have a few questions that I want to get to too because I just see them popping up and I want to feel I don't want you guys to feel like you're not. Oh, this is good. Okay. You're not loved. <laughs> um, so we have what do we have here? Is Carbon pricing, a one-size-fits-all for all nations. Well, that's a very good question. And I'm going to share this on my Facebook, so I don't want you to feel like I'm not paying attention, but I'm going to go right here. This is well, part, of the, part of the communicating <laughs> thing. Um, uh, so the, one of the great things about carbon pricing is that it's not a one-size-fits-all, that it's a very flexible solution. Because at the heart, like what we were just talking about, 
the, the, the kind of the heart of it is a very elegant, simple concept. That you take the costs, the external costs that happen when the fuel is burned and you put them into the original source. So that can manifest in all sorts of ways and we're seeing that around the globe already. Um, California has a cap and trade system. Uh, different parts of Canada have different types of systems. Um, there, you know, there's a carbon uh, fee and dividend kind of area, uh, plan in, in parts of Canada. There's China is starting a cap and trade program. There, there are everywhere. Europe has one. Um, and so these, there's a few different kind of ways of doing this. So the two camps that they fall in, I'll try to get my hands in the right position, um, <laughs> is um, there's the cap and trade solution, which is, a, it's called a quantity plan. And then there's the a fee, putting a fee or a tax on the carbon, which is a, which is a price. Um, and they have different benefits, different pros and cons, and people kind of fall on different sides of the, of the um, issue on that. And I think it is, it just depends on what's best for your country or your state. Um, there are even some people doing it at the city level. I don't actually know too much about that, but it's something we're going to look into more, actually. <laughs> we have plans to look into that more. Um, and there's also companies that are taking these prices, and they're already internalizing these prices into their business model. Um, so that's the, the, the two kind of main solutions you'll see is a cap and trade and a carbon fee or, or tax. And the, the cap and trade has a lot of uh, certainty when it comes to how many emissions, because there's a cap on how many emissions will be allowed. So you know that emissions won't go over that. But the price goes up and down because it actually creates a new market. So it's, that one is, is, you know, there's a, it's kind of nice that you know that you can't go over this amount of emissions. Um, but the market does create this kind of, you know, new complication, and it's harder for business models to kind of incorporate that into their long-term future plans. Um, and then you have the kind of fee or tax, which is, it's not, a, there's kind of uncertainty in terms of how many emissions will be created, because it's not capped, um, but the price is set, and, and it usually starts at a certain amount, and then each year goes up a little bit. So businesses like that, um, because they can just put that into their business model and they kind of future-proof their businesses. And we're seeing that from like Disney and ExxonMobil and um, you know, a lot of really big companies are already doing that. Um, so yeah, so and then within those two models, there's all sorts of things. There's like, there's a pot of money that's created by either system and what you do with that is very flexible and depends, you know, you. There's a lot of kind of justice issues in terms of making sure that like low income families aren't affected too much. So you want to, you can use that to offset those in different ways. So there's a lot of, a lot of ways you can use this to your advantage, whether you're a government or a company or anything. How, um, Kai, how yeah. do you make this, um, all, all these ideas that we're talking about, like accessible and sexy? Like how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you like, you know, we talk all day long, like, oh, let's, you know, we, now that we've done so much stuff, yeah. it's like, great, we get it. Like, tax, put it, carbon tax or cap and trade, all these different fun things. But how do you make that then be like, so people out in the street are like, I'm going to talk about carbon pricing. <laughs> Very good question. I think we have, it's kind I of think we do that. have that too. Uh, we have, but, what is your approach to making the concept of carbon pricing simple for everyone to understand? But I think past that, not only simple to understand, simple and but also like, let's let's talk about yeah. carbon pricing. Like exciting. Yeah. Well, the reason I get excited about um, it, um, as as a young person um, who cares about justice issues, is I do think it it corrects this kind of justice issue that that we the taxpayers are paying for these costs and and we shouldn't be. They mm -hmm. should be incorporated mm -hmm. at the beginning. So I think that it's something that that especially, you know, all people should kind of get upset about that that's been happening for so long and it's then created this problem that we're dealing with um, and we need to fix it. Yeah. We need to fix it. And the other thing, I think it's like, it's a kind of paradigm shift. And so I think for young people that I've talked to, um, it's kind of an exciting thing because it's like, it just shifts the whole paradigm that we've been living in, that this old system that this industrial kind of, you know, clouds of black smoke system that we, yeah. that we kind of have grown up with, it's time for that to change. And this is one of those kind of first steps of, of really shifting that. So I think 
I think young people should really own this solution um, and kind of get excited about it because it's it's about justice, it's about the new world that we want to create. Yeah. Um, so then, so th so that's why I think it's exciting. Yeah. And I think in terms of community, do you have thoughts about no, communicating I mean, it? Well, I I going off of that, like why what why am I excited about this? Yeah. Because. I get excited because I think it's a it, it really like brings everyone to the table. Everyone yeah. is now a participant in the world of solving this issue and it's like there's so many solutions out there for all this to happen. And then you come together, it's an egoless way of solving things. And I think that that's it's everyone can connect with that. Everyone mm. can be like this is the planet we live on, like let's do something about it. And whether that's carbon pricing, whether that's activism, whether that's filmmaking, whether that's just talking to your family or friends from your hometown. Like I find that yeah. that yeah. in terms of communication, just having this as a dialogue, just starting like a lot of people in the climate world know about carbon pricing, but I would say a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that you know, they're like, they hear carbon tax, they're like, I don't, I don't know what that is. And that's, and that to me is like, it needs to be in the vernacular of like, let's keep talking about this. And like, let's get excited about it. And yeah. when you start going down the rabbit hole, and you're like, wow, this is really, really fascinating. Like, this is, this is a solution that's like, just pierces it. Right. Like, yeah, great. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and I think that that, you know, one thing we've been trying to figure out is kind of how how do you communicate this in a simple way and I do I think it kind of comes down to like if you can strip away all the complications because of course it bring you know if you start to go into it all the policy the a lot of mechanisms and it does get kind of complica complicated and complicated complicated that's how complicated it gets <laughs> it gets complicated <laughs> um, and there's acronyms and all this stuff but if you strip that away just to the elegant solution itself, I actually think it's pretty easy to understand. Um, and I think that if you can, you know, you kind of find analogies that, mm. um, you know, like one thing that, that's kind of an issue with carbon uh, pollution with the CO2 in the air is that it's invisible. And so it makes it harder to kind of get that to feel immediate mm. because people mm -hmm. can't see it whereas say this was a problem just blast like pink in there, <laughs> like this is CO2, Color the CO2. <laughs> um, but like if it was a problem where there was a company by a river and it was cheaper for them just to dump all the waste in the river which just used to happen mm. and then people downstream were having to pay to clean up the river or it was infecting their you know their water and they were paying healthcare costs because of that it would be pretty clear that you would say to the company, you don't get to put that all your waste in the river because that's cheaper for you because we're paying for all that. You should pay right. to, to take care of that waste at the beginning so that we have clean water and well, like, and it's not our responsibility. Well, that is why we have clean water, clean air. Because so, we've, yeah, fix that. Because, because we, there has been implementation of saying, hey, we need to have a Clean Air Act. You know, right. that, that happened and that forced companies to shift in that direction. Right. So that's where we're at with carbon pricing, I think, is shifting that into that direction. And one thing where it kind of breaks through some of the partisanship that is around climate issues is that it's, it's, it's correcting a market failure. So it's actually dealing with the market's failure to take those costs into account and you're correcting that rather than because you can do it with regulation and this is a way of kind of it helps um, to bring this forward because it is a free market solution and that kind of speaks to people on both sides of the, of the political spectrum which I think is important because I think we all need to come together this is not a climate change is not a partisan issue we it's, are we are human beings on the planet of earth <laughs> that breathe air yeah and need to eat food and we all need to eat we all need to breathe air we all <laughs> want to survive so yeah this isn't a political issue and this is i see it as a non-partisan uh solution so that's another reason why right. i like it what what do you think um stop like why what what stops this implementation happening 
Um, <clears throat> I think, well, one thing that we found when we were talking to people is we kind of heard over and over again that there's like the money is there, the technology is there, the political will is not there for some of these solutions. And I think that's true for carbon pricing. I mean, we're seeing more and more of it being um, brought up on high level discussions by very important people. So I think it's, mm -hmm. it is out there as something that people, a lot of possibly unexpected people are calling for it as a solution. Um, but I think like what you said, like it's not in the vernacular and it's like you kind of need to hit that, that threshold of um, support, I think, within the people mm -hmm. to really push the political will that like, we want this, we want a price on carbon. Um, and, even, and even when you, sh like, even if it's someone not going out, but just talking about it with family members, like, I think that's oh, so wow. important, so I powerful. Yeah, because then that affects, you know, maybe your family wouldn't come be an activist, but they mm. would show up to a, you know, voting booth, perhaps, and then, you know, they would see that issue and be like, oh, I know about this, I've talked about it. Like, even that is powerful. And, I th again, it's, it's getting it into the vernacular and just yeah. keep talking about it. Yeah. Keep making it sexy in your own Yeah. Way. You know, it's like... Like, get, like <laughs> find ways of making your friends excited about it. Yeah. If you're excited about it, like, make that contagious. Well, I get excited about it because I find that there's opportunity um, to now invest in renewables like there are at, like if we're talking about other ways besides carbon pricing to solve this solution there are ways now there are apps out there that you can invest in clean energy mm -hmm. and that like gets me really excited it's like what i can make money off this and do the right thing yeah and it it benefits everyone like <laughs> 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 We might spend too much time together. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think, no, I think that's so true. And I just, I've just seen a comment here. Um, it says, carbon pricing regulates emissions, but does not necessarily support alternative carbon neutral innovation, which is most critical. Totally agree that it's very critical to have carbon neutral innovation. And I actually think, mm -hmm. as we were saying before, that carbon pricing, it doesn't directly, um, you know, do that. It doesn't directly... Uh, support alternative innovation, but it yeah. does indirectly very much support because it it, it changes so the market. It changes the market. Yeah. It shifts where the investments are going. That people will see that investing in carbon-based fuels is more expensive, and they don't. It's not a good return for your money, and so that money will start to shift, and it will shift to energy forms of energy that don't emit CO two. Mm -hmm. So I think. Although sometimes the links on carbon pricing aren't, you know, clear, like, clear, thick line, there is a, a definite, when you follow that thread, yes. it really does support all the other solutions, which all are critical and all need to happen. Um, right. I was talking to someone in finance last night. It's like, people aren't going to just shift, you know, what, what is it in their interest? If they're worried about, like, just getting their kids through college, how are they going to, like, what makes yeah. them want to shift to not supporting fossil fuels. I mean, there's no, there, there's yeah. no incentive. There's but, no economic incentive. Right so now. that's why I think it's like you do need carbon pricing because it, then it, it, it forces the market to start going into a direction. Into an honest direction. It's not even, yes. it's not yeah. a, like, a, a, you know, forcing it into a direction it shouldn't be going in. It's forcing it into the direction that is more honest. Right. Which right. is another reason why I like it. It's like it's stripping away the artificiality of what of what we've been living right. in and creating something that they, this is the honest price and we need to deal with that and that shifts our, our economy. And I think too, you're right, we do have to come up with innovative solutions or innovative is the, <laughs> British, the, Brits, say. the Brits say. But you, you really do need to come up with innovative solutions simultaneously to this happening yes. because it's kind of, we've talked about this so much just like whenever we talk about this, it's a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So you have private sectors doing innovative solutions to really drive that. I mean, you have people like Elon Musk doing that already, just yeah. like really like, I'm going to do this. And simultaneously having the top-down bring that into play. So then, it's, then it kind of e equals out. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's the thing I always say. It's like 
it's not we're saying, you know, you do this or you price carbon and it fixes the right. problem. Like, no, 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 no. We, we need to do all of it. All. <laughs> and, 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 and. Well, and that's, and I think that goes back to our documentary is that's yes. what we kind of saw. We saw that it was not just a one, one issue thing. It's like, that's why you had a post-it of like carbon pricing. Yes. Technology. Yes. Like activism. So all these things are. Exactly. So when you, if you watch the, the video, which I hope you do, um, that, that won the carbon pricing, we're just doing a little plug here. <laughs> I'll put that up. Um, so, so we made this, this video about carbon pricing, but it was part of a series um, called Climate Countdown, which is a web series that we made um, in the lead up to COP21 in Paris at the end of 2015. And it, what, we, what our goal was, it was to map out the ecology of climate solutions. So to, to explore these different solutions that people were working on, um, and find out kind of how they connect and how they help each other. Um, so you'll see when you watch the, uh, the carbon pricing video, there's a book that we have that has post-its and arrows and notes, and it's kind of the whole book we work through, um, and there's, in, in each episode you'll see different parts of it, and it all starts to build into a bigger whole, which I think is kind of, you know, we, so we have episodes on, um, help me out, we've got, we start out with, with cop, well, we first with started out process. with what is what, what is, is it? This? What is this? What are we doing? If, you, if you're a, if you're a newbie at this, which which, which we I were, <laughs> still sometimes feel like it's so much. Don't feel discouraged because it really um, is an interesting and exciting world, and and there's no you don't have to be an expert. This is right. this is a very human issue. So don't don't feel like oh I have to be knowledgeable. I don't have to be in that world. You don't have no. to be in that world, and no, no, no. that's. That's what's huge, and that's what's important. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here yeah. today. Is like, don't be discouraged. Just yeah, we be, have a beginner's mind. Actually, like yeah. I want to have a still yeah. a beginner's mind of like, and no, listening, because then you get to keep listening to solutions, effective solutions, and you get to kind of reflect on that. Yeah, and bring that to the table, and then you have your own systematic way of saying, well, this is what I'm going to do. Right, and I think that's what we like. We started with nothing. We, we yeah. really didn't know anything. And we started making this series and talking to people and we were kind of looking for entry points for ourselves but also like for our audience that the more facets of the, the solutions that we explored, the more entry points there would be. So it's not like, you know, like carbon pricing is not a one-size-fits-all solution. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Yeah. It's like everyone has their specific solution that will speak to them in terms of getting them excited, but also speak to their skills. So we were trying to create kind of a, a holistic, coherent yeah. kind of map of all of these different solutions. Um, and it is very, it just works its way through very basic. We try to get, anytime anyone says an acronym, we like stop them and we <laughs> explain. So it's, we, if you don't know don't anything, it's a great scared. place to start. We, we were like, wait, 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 let me just, let me rephrase that in a way that I can understand. Um, so we talk. So we start with the kind of COP process, and then uh, we. I went to Bonn and kind of the different issues that that the negotiators were dealing with in the lead up to Paris. Um, and then we we did an episode on implementation. Like, how do you implement this? Right. <laughs> how does that work? We did an episode on divestment as a as a tool. We did an episode on youth. Mm -hmm. um, we did a few episodes in Paris to kind of get the feel for like what it was like there when they were negotiating the Paris Agreement at COP21. Um, we did an episode on indigenous rights, why that's important. Yeah. We that's did cool. 16 episodes in all, so I can't even remember right now what they're all about, but um, um, first check of it all, out, Climate Countdown. Hi, David, my friend David. Hello. Thank you for the shout out. And also, I'm curious to, in other words, what stuff ended up on the cutting room. Like, what? Oh. what do we wish we could have done? Oh, many, I, I tell you. Many things we many, wish. We actually have, we're working on our second season right now. So yes. we're developing it. And um, so you will see more. The, the main thing I think for me that I, two, two main things that ended up not being the first season that will definitely be in the second season. But we have like amazing footage from really, really intelligent, beautiful people who are mm -hmm. working on this that we... It was just too much to handle before Paris. We had to get through so much content just to make Paris make sense to us <laughs> that we didn't end up talking about finance and the money part of it nearly as much as I wanted. And also communication, like how do you, how do we communicate this issue 
better and these solutions better more importantly um, so we have I have two we have a lot of footage from both those that will be going into um, second season we talked to people who are uh, running the New York Green Bank and the Connecticut Green Bank and people who are working on green bonds and climate risk and really I know that like finance for young people especially sometimes it's like Whew. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's how I feel sometimes. Yeah. But then it's but not. Then you talk to them, and you're like, "Oh, this is fascinating." And it's the same yeah. kind of thing where, like, they're reinventing the way this works, and that's really exciting to me. I so, agree. much more about the money because the money is super important, and there's a lot of that happening in the private sector as well as the public sector. Um, and then the other part of this is like, yeah, communications. We had some really interesting interviews with people who are kind of professional climate communicators and psychologists to like blend the work of psychology and um, science and policy yeah. and like what what barriers people have to um, when they hear of climate issues and how do you bypass those barriers and talk to people um, in a way that doesn't kind of throw up resistance. Yeah, I mean so at the end of the day too it's like if you're passionate about something and you're and it's not ego based. You're able to talk about it, and you're, you're not having like an attachment to, like you have to do this. Right. Like it, it, if you separate that and you just talk about it, like, hey, I'm really interested in this issue, and I know I know a few things. I've learned a few things. That then that that's how you communicate with someone because then it's you've created a story, if you will, mm. and I um, and that's why we film. I think because yeah. we we are storytellers and what we do is we are able to express things visually and put it you know when you see film when you see even watching us there's a interaction you see how I move how I think and and then it's like oh that's a human connection we, I mean that's essentially what we are here on this planet we have human connections like yeah. that's what we are and um, that's what makes us tick and so I think storytelling filmmaking really brings that to the table because you get to experience what we're experiencing and you get to see what other people are doing and that has a more visceral reaction so you're able to connect with that yeah versus like figures like that you may know you, the figures are helpful but it sometimes it's, yeah. it goes over people's head not everyone operates that way yeah and i think it's one thing we've been playing with is this idea of storytelling like storytelling is so powerful and so when you're talking to people about climate solutions um, who may not agree with you, if you can really connect with them, hear their story and then tell your story and and find your common ground and like mm -hmm. f talk about it in a values way rather than like a fact. It's like this is the fact, and if you don't believe, then you're wrong. Like that doesn't help, <laughs> you know. So we've been we've been thinking about that, you know, on a personal level, but then also like in terms of making a series that that operates on that level that it's about you know it's it's just about kind of values and just telling this the story itself um, and yeah we're exploring all sorts of ways to do that it's still it's always an ongoing ongoing project lifelong project to tell there's better no, stories there's but. no end and there and I think that's cool too because there's no really like there's no like end goal it's like to no. make the world a better place there's not <laughs> like well we've done it <laughs> yeah. Over check. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not that. There's always going to be issues. And so. there's always going to be more stories. Yeah. Like, that's the great thing, too, about, like, there's not one way to talk about climate solutions to people. Um, yeah. There's all sorts of different solutions, and then there's all sorts of different stories, and there's different ways of telling each solution, and, and it depends on who you are, and it depends on who the person is, and who your audience is, and... Yeah, and every story is valuable. And, yeah, and, absolutely. And, again, like you said, I mean, it, it then connects... People resonate with different means of storytelling, but I think that that's the issue. Is like everyone has to come to the table. If you're interested in finance, if you're interested in technology, if you're interested in activism, right. all of that plays a part. Yeah, so keep keep doing it. Well, we have a question from <sighs> from David. Uh, what are the challenges of storytelling without including personal bias? Oh, David, a question. I'm so glad you're listening. This is like <laughs> makes my day. Um, also, I just saw David in L.A. when I was out there, so and we actually talked about this. So it was kind of bringing it to the table, like, let's talk about 
what I'm doing, I asked him what he was doing, and he's killing it out there, and he asked me what I was doing, and I told him about this and other projects, and, uh, you know, that that's that's all. I mean, sorry. Anyways, thank you, David. <laughs> um, well, I didn't even read the question. I'm just excited. <laughs> read it to me what, again. What are the challenges of storytelling without including uh, personal bias? It's a good question. I, mm, I don't know if you can take out yourself completely from the picture. I think that that inherently you have a personal bias is <laughs> I just read that um, you have a personal you have you have a personal bias by just being a person like you have a certain perspective right. I come from Little Rock Arkansas I have a certain perspective I grew up in a certain environment um, so just I went really Arkansas there with did the I just too. go really <laughs> yeah, you know it's important to talk about this stuff so I'm gonna have a certain way of approaching things but the I think an interesting question though with storytelling is really listening yeah and I think <laughs> listening, listening. <laughs> uh, if you're and really just kind of absorbing it and you know bringing I think that 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 truth that resonates inside you like when you when you tap into that that is kind of egoless and then you're able to say well this is what this is my mosaic that I am and that has truth and beauty in it. And I'm able to then bring that to the table. And that will, re it won't resonate with everyone, right. um, but it will resonate with other people. And so I think if everyone is being their most beautiful mosaic, I'm making this up on the spot. If everyone's being their like beautiful it. mosaic that they are and really residing in that place, then you're able to bring forth your own creative solutions that do resonate with people that I, predict, I wouldn't be able to resonate with, but someone else would be able to resonate with. Yeah, and I so, think, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right that I think to try to shed your personal bias actually doesn't help because I think, you know, know it, being aware of your personal bias, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, and so knowing where you come from and that you have a different perspective than the people you're talking to, than your audience or that, or the one person you're talking to. But I think being aware of and kind of embracing it, like your personal bias is kind of your personal story, you know? And I think it's only, it's only a harmful bias if you're not listening to the other person. If you think that your mm -hmm. way of seeing the world is the only way of seeing the world, then it becomes, then it makes it hard to talk to people, I think. But if you know yeah. that your perspective is one of many, but that yours is the one that you know, then like the story you tell will come from that place and it, it it always does and then you will listen and hear other people's stories and try to make a you know be open minded and and make a good decision based on everything or or tell better stories based on what you hear and i think too a big part of this is asking questions yeah. like really because then you and you're not you're, assuming exactly yeah. and then and then you're able to like really listen and you're kind of your scope like my my frame of my scope of my worldview is like continuously, continuously increases yeah. because I've asked, especially about climate stuff, I didn't know anything about it. And now it's like, I know so much more and it keep my lens keeps opening up. Yeah. So then it's like, it just makes my world richer and then I can bring more to the table. Yeah. And with, you're right, because the other issue is like you, there are people who have a, ego driven way of how they communicate and that's their story that's their bias and it's like i mean i think that's where we at or are at in right now in the world is like people it's very insular like mm. your world well i i've read this so i'm gonna believe that and it's in instead of asking questions i mean i think it yeah and i think i think like you said it's asking people questions that you're talking to you may have an assumption of why you think the way they think. Or sorry, why, why you think they think the way they think. Uh, <laughs> but without asking them why they feel that way, you, your assumption might be wrong and you might be trying to tell them something in a way that matches your vision of why they think that way. Mm. And actually, when you hear their reasoning, you're like, oh, that's my reasoning or you know like yeah. you might find that there's something in there that you're like oh that makes complete sense and I didn't know that so right. I do think yeah I think it's just important to be aware and to be open um, David oh and, uh, yes. and 
Another on that question. Front, on that front, was it easy or challenging to find people to interview that would tell your story? Um, I mean, we talked to all sorts of people. So I think we were, when we went in, we were very much like, uh, we would just say like, mm. what are you doing? <laughs> tell us why you're excited about what you're doing and, and how to, and then we try to figure out like, how does it fit in? Yeah. And I think, well, we, a bigger story. And I think we came to the table with a really, with an idea of like, we want to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. So that, that was kind of like, we would listen and I, would everything resonate? Well, I'd say like 99% of the time because people are in the, in the climate world, they know what's up. So they're like, <laughs> Guys, this is a huge issue. And so everyone's kind of passionate about yeah. sharing what they're working on um, because it is a contentious issue that's, well, it's uh, a human issue. It's, and so, Cleric, more question. Um, how much was your story affected by their answers? Mm. Oh, like completely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, we... I really was moved by indigenous people. Yeah. Like, my... I, crying right now because it's like the there is there is some serious people are being displaced from their homes and I mean it really like just hearing their story when we would go and like what their people are going through it's like man yeah. they are and they have such <clears throat> they're it, they're not even mad they're just they're so they're passionate and they're like actually really hopeful I would say and, yeah, and, I mean, and if, if I was in that position, I'd be pissed. But they literally are like, we can do this and we're going to keep our heads up. Like, that's what the message I got from almost every indigenous person. I'm sure people in their society might not feel that way, but their representatives felt that way and they were very positive. And that, but that really affected me because I got to witness that firsthand of like, oh, you're here. Like, yeah. I, and you can see things, pictures, you can, you know, and that's what we hope to do with our climate countdown documentary is to kind of like bring that to the table so people can see what we, what we experience. Right. right. And I think we went into it without really an agenda, except that we wanted to find out what solutions there were. That was it. We just, we're starting with solutions. That was what we started with. And so every story we, we found, every person we talked to shaped where we were going. Um, we didn't have like a plan in terms of for season two because we we're starting with more information we, we are shaping it a little bit more to begin with because we we've talked to so many people already mm -hmm. um but yeah we we you know we didn't plan all the episodes beforehand it was kind of you'd edit one episode and be like oh i think the next thing we have to explore like you figure out like what questions do i have after that episode and then you would, that would be the next episode <laughs> yeah. because you'd be like, well, I don't understand that. Um, so it was very influenced by, by the stories we got. And I, and I think that's a good way to kind of, you know, to go into storytelling or making films uh, for any budding filmmakers out there um, is to go in, you know, with an idea, you might have an idea of where mm -hmm. you think it'll go, but I don't be, attached to that. Don't be married to this idea, this like goal of like, I'm going to argue this point. It's like, right. go in with questions. And you might have an idea of where those questions and answers will lead. But I think you, you're usually surprised of where, where you end up at the end. <laughs> good, good way to walk around in general. It's yes. true. Yeah. David, you've asked amazing questions. Thank you. This is a really, I mean, getting to the heart of what we're trying to do. Yeah. And, and just kind of, and how to how to do it and I think that I think that that's what where people feel a little lost maybe of like what can I do um, in the climate world I think that that's a big yeah well it's a lot question. it's like a it's such a big problem mm -hmm. and it's such an existential crisis for the human race that it's it's a lot of responsibility to take on <laughs> if you want to try to help so yeah. it's easy to get overwhelmed and I think and it's easy to get kind of Cynical, I think, and pessimistic yeah. because it does seem so big and daunting. Um, but I think one thing that I, I kind of decided going you know, as as I went through Climate Countdown, um, that I decided I was going to be optimistic and have hope, because I feel like when you have hope, you feel more empowered. Um, 
And there's a lot to be hopeful about. There are a lot of very exciting solutions out there. So I think find one that excites you most. Don't take on everything. <laughs> you don't, you're not going to fix the world by yourself. Um, so whatever skill set you have, find something that excites you, that you can lend that skill set to, and do that. You know, you don't have to do everything. Yeah. Um, and and honestly, I'm not going to shape financial policy, <laughs> but I might talk to people about it and then edit something and tell other people about it because that's what I do. And you kind of build a community by doing that, which I think is another great thing. We've seen a lot of people in Paris and Marrakesh and at these cops. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, it's like a family yeah. now. We really, we go to, you know, having never been in the climate world before, we now have been to two cops and we have like a little climate family that we see. It's yeah. great. It's and really wonderful. Yeah, and I think that that too, it's like when you find something you're passionate about, that's a life thing, but also in the climate world, it's like you find other people that are like-minded and you're able to, you know, connect. Connect for climate. For climate. <laughs> <laughs> what? Full circle. Um, yeah, and I think I think one thing to the youth as well, so the, the youth or the young people or the new generation, the Ute. up and coming, the youth, um, which we are a part of, and then there are generations younger than us now that are coming into their own. And I think I have found my most inspiring times in this whole journey have been talking to young people. Um, and... I just find their their minds are working at a different pace and they're not constrained by the box that we have placed our economy and our society and our policy in. Like they're thinking outside that box because they have this fresh perspective and yeah. I think the more that that fresh perspective can be incorporated into the solutions we're building now, the better because we and those generations younger than us, we're going to inherit all of the problems of climate change, but we're also going to inherit all the solutions right. that are being created now. So the more that you, young people, can be engaged in the creation of those solutions or aware of what those solutions are, like we're going to inherit all of those, we're going to take all those over. Um, so you have a lot to lend to that process. And I think... I think that the solutions really speak to young people. It's like about economic, um, you know, paradigm shifts, which are super exciting. It's about climate justice, which is, you know, you need to be passionate about. I think most people are, most young people are. Um, it's about cool, new, slick, sexy technology, which is awesome. Uh, so it's like, it's all the kind of things that are worth getting excited about. And I would say too, not only youth, but also we've seen a lot of people older than us really get involved, and that's really inspiring. Like, it's never too old. You're never too old or too young to be a part of this process. I yeah, mean, we, absolutely. We seven-year-olds that we know being a part of this process, and I think that that, you know, we're all here right now. It's like we all yep. got to do it. Yeah. That's the I dance for yeah. today. Yeah. Gotta do gotta it. Gotta do it. <laughs> um, thanks for all the shout outs, guys. Yeah, this, this has is been fun. Really awesome. Um, I think we're, I we think went we're to 48 near, minutes. I think we're nearing the end. Um, Is there any less, last questions? Post them now. We'll, um, we'll stall for like any, any, five minutes. Any and, final uh, message? Any final thoughts or what, messages? What about for any final oh, thoughts? Oh, from us. Yeah, from you. Um, I'm interested. Um, I mean, I, I think. I think a couple things. I think for again, young people like this is this is our future. It's future of humanity. Really. It's um it's important. It's really important. And the the rate of change we're seeing now is we need to act now. And we need to do it we need to like boost our efforts tenfold because we need to start putting these solutions. I mean, the solutions are being put in place. I shouldn't say we need to start because lots of people are doing great work and there is a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. One thing from Paris, we went to Paris and there's a lot of momentum from COP21 and from the Paris Agreement. Um, and it's exciting and we need to build on that. But we also need to increase it. And that, that comes from each individual taking part in the whole and also continuing those conversations on an individual level I think yeah. and and the urgency cannot be stressed enough it's 
urgent, it's important, and it's exciting, I think. I think it's an exciting mm -hmm. change if we can really own it and, and uh, push it forward. Yeah. How about you? No, I, um, I agree. I think that that's important. I think, too, talk about it. Yeah, I mean, tell at, your story. At the end of the day, just start talking about Like, you can talk about all your woes and problems, but, you know, try it. Just maybe just start being like, I think this this uh, new technology that's coming out, like, that excites me. Talk about that. Like, that gets this dialogue going. I think dialogue and communicating about all of this stuff is, that's what, I mean, if, if we don't talk about it, we don't take action. Like, that. the, right. fir the first step is to just get it in our minds and then you're able once you have that seed of thought in your in your body then you're able to say well you know it'll grow and over time it'll like say in a month you'll be like oh i can do something that i never thought of before so but i think that that's why it's important like i've talked to my parents now and you know they didn't know anything about this and now they're they're just they they know what's up they know they're interested and their their worldview has grown a little bit so i think if that dialogue continues at every level, you will then find a solution to change things. Yeah, and I think um, we have one more question. And I also want to say that if you want to know more about carbon pricing, first off, if you haven't watched our video, I put it up because it's it's or a, put the it's a nice beginner's level. Don't need to know anything before then. Um, and then there's a lot of great groups doing great work on carbon pricing, um, and there's a lot of other materials out there. So so read up on it. It's exciting. Um, and and you can find out more and then tell your friends about it. And then they'll ask you questions and you don't know the answer and then you'll look it up and you'll next time you'll say, I'll get back to you on that. Um, yeah, our final question is, and uh, this is a very interesting topic, I think um, Africa is in a very interesting position because um, they're trying to develop, uh, different countries there are trying to develop as, you know, as other countries would, and we're as basically, we as we did, as other other Develop, Western yeah. developed worlds have developed of just using fossil fuels to grow their economies. So basically it's, it's a really tough issue because the world at, at the cops has basically been like, well, you guys need to bypass this. And it's like, how? That, the question is how do they just skip? They did skip, um, I know there's some countries in Africa that skipped straight to uh, wireless telephones. So they didn't Rather have than to, going through the wired right, right. wired route. So it is possible, but I do think we've, uh, there are countries like the U.S. and other, um, what do they call it, historic, what's the, what's the ooh, word? There's a word ooh, for this. There's a whole acronym um, ooh, that I might not think remember about it. right now. Um, but Go back and watch <laughs> Which episode? One of our Bond episodes. It's a his, it's it's country so developed. historically responsible. Yeah. Yes. But basically, it's the Ooh. idea of saying ancient history. We're countries that have progressed to a certain point using fossil fuels like are the United morally States and obligated to help countries bypass that process. Yeah. That's so, my understanding of it. And and it, um, countries in Africa, like you were saying, it. They're in a very difficult place in India because they, they're developing and they are now facing that the most vulnerable when it comes mm -hmm. to the effects of climate change, but they've also had the least, they've contributed the least towards climate change. So rich countries are the main contributors and or, you know, historically have been the main contributors and we're a little bit, there's a buffer because we're more developed that they're not as vulnerable. So it is, it's a, again, going back to the justice issue, there's a lot of justice issues there. And Kenny is asking specifically about carbon pricing yeah. in Africa, um, which is great. I actually, this is one of those things where I don't know that much about carbon pricing in Africa, so I might have to learn more right. about that and get back to you. Because yeah. that's a really interesting subject that I, I need to know more about. I agree with that. I, I do, the interesting thing about Africa, though, that I find fascinating is by 2050, um, the world's main pocket of population, right now it's in Indonesia, China, um, India, that area, that pocket's going to move to Africa. Um, they're having more, they're having a population boom. And mm. that, that when you have more population, you have to have 
more energy, more resources, more food, and all of that produces right now that produces a lot of carbon and greenhouse gases. Right. So, so you're having if you can price carbon now before <laughs> those fossil fuel industries grow, I mean, that would be huge, I right. think. Right. Now without knowing that's that's me not knowing that much about it in detail, but yeah. From from what I know from other experiences that that seems like it was an important in terms of the future that yeah. you can catch it before the it develops too much, and then it's harder to put in place. Um, but uh, and in terms of how co countries implement that, um, that I yeah, I don't think we have an answer to that. And but I actually am. That would be an interesting topic to. Yes, well, watch out for season two. <laughs> um, and I also I, I wanted to mention that keep your eye on people. Uh, countries more and more countries are announcing carbon pricing schemes, mm -hmm. and companies and states. Um, California, I'm from California, so I always look with pride at the uh, action that they're taking on climate, and they are revamping their cap-and-trade system right now to make it more aggressive, which is exciting. So there's uh, schemes in place already, and then there's kind of pushing those forward and making them more ambitious to make them more uh, effective. Mm -hmm. And all of that's happening, so it's really good just to keep up to breast. I know that as of the end of last year, about, I think, 12% or 14% of the world's emissions were had a price put into place. And when China's system comes under line, um, it'll be about 25%. Now, that's varying prices, so we need to always keep looking for more ambition. Um, and, and that's kind of, <laughs> overall, we need to just keep everything that people are doing is great. Uh, anything you're doing to take action on climate Thank you. Thanks. Keep doing it and then keep boosting it. Yeah. That's what we need to do. Everyone needs to like, you need to have gratitude for what everyone is doing because people are putting a lot of hours on this, a lot of their lives devoted. Uh, and we need to just keep pushing. Yeah. And huge shout out to Connect for Climate. Thanks for hosting us yes, today. Yes. Thank you. Um, and all the partners as well. Yeah. You guys are fantastic and you do such great things. So people, if you don't if you're not aware of Connect for Climate and connect with them, yeah, check it out. Um, they're really, really special, and yeah. uh, we've we love everyone there. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, and thank yeah, and check out our Climate Countdown if you're yes, interested. Go to climatecountdown.org and reach out if you if you have right? questions. Climatecountdown.org. I that got is it right. I we're also there. on Facebook, um, and uh, if you have, and we're on Twitter and Instagram. All the things. Yeah, and ask. We're here. I mean, yeah, you know, ask us questions. Find, you can find us out um, through climatecountdown.org. Reach out to us because you know this is a dialogue. So yes. we want to we want to be able to help because we were a new we were newbies at one point too. Yeah. So. Yeah. So please stay in touch, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for guys. listening. We went, this was we fun. went a long time. <laughs> Thanks, Kaya. High five. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.